kesenangan bermula dari perancangan yang bijak. Demi masa depan yang lebih bermakna, setiap gerak langkah harus dinilai. Bina simpanan asas persaraan anda di usia muda. Langkah pertama buat belia yang penuh impian. Impian adalah milik semua. Cabaran di hari ini adalah pemangkin kejayaan di masa hadapan. Diri anda adalah penasihat kewangan sendiri. Dengan mencarum melebihi kadar berkanon, anda boleh gandakan wang simpanan anda. Insan yang tidak pernah mengenal lelah. Sentiasa memberikan yang terbaik buat keluarga. Persaraan bukanlah penamat kehidupan. Ia adalah permulaan yang baharu. Pilihan di tangan anda. Right, you're watching She Needs a Four. Don't go broke in your golden years. I've got panelists up on stage with me. Thank you so much for being here, ladies. A round of applause for our amazing ladies who've accomplished so much and who continue to do so much. Now, we're going to get right into it. How are all of you today? How are you doing, class? Excited. Excited? Much to share today? Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> Erin? Alhamdulillah, very happy to see the crowd. Big ups to all of you for being here. Thank you. Talking about money can be a bit dry. So having this crowd just helps us. I, right. I believe, I believe. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and Balkis, how are you doing today? Very good. Thank you, Jesse. And I'm thrilled to be here. Thanks everyone for supporting us. We're going to have a Q&A session as well towards the end, so do save your questions uh, for then. Before I get into it, I'd like to actually read you some stats, and this is quite interesting. According to EPF, and do com uh, correct me if I'm wrong, 54% of EPF members aged 54 and above, that's in your golden years, have had less than 50,000 ringgit savings for retirement. And women make 63% of this group, so more than half being the majority percentage there. As of 2022, women's life expectancy in Malaysia is 78 years compared to men who are at 73 years. So generally speaking, women, we live longer with lesser money. We also retire earlier from our lower paying jobs. So no good, we've got to change that, right? But the question is, why is this happening? Now, the World Bank in 2022 in its Global Financial Inclusion Index revealed that in developing economies, there's still a 9 percentage point gender gap in account ownership. Fine, but this gap widens when it comes to financial knowledge. And a 2022 or uh, 2020 OC, OECD study had found that women are 10% less likely than men to answer financial questions correctly, meaning to say our financial knowledge is perhaps not uh, the, the most uh, robust at this point. And so 30% of women globally are only confident of their retirement planning compared to 50% of men, which means that we are lacking behind. But the good news is financial literacy can be learned and we can polish our skills in that. Without giving you more stats, which are important, I can do that later, I want us to all to wake up. This is a wake up call. Let's turn the tide. Let's make that difference today. And so here we are with our panel. Now, first up, let me have this as an open uh, question. Why is it crucial to start saving for retirement early? Why is it especially crucial for women? Balkis, maybe I'll start with you. Thanks, Jesse. It's a great question. So I think it's mentioned by you, number one is longer life expectancy. So for women globally, we do live between 5 to 10 years longer than men, depending on the stage of economic development as well as your lifestyle choices. But the human body, for instance, has the capacity to be living up to 90 years old, free of any disease. So we're technically throwing like 20 years on the table just because we are not being healthy, right? So for, for women especially, we tend to outlive men Maybe because we express ourselves better, right? We are women, you know, the hands that rock the cradle rule the world, right? So we, we are there. So, but however, 
we are going to live longer and we do not have our spouse, our significant other to support yourself because that person has, you know, graduated in this life before you do. So then you need to think about it, you know. So how are you going to live, uh, you know, into your twilight years without support? So it's very important because of women's life expectancy, we need to prepare for this. When you look at retirement, yeah, that's issue number one. But you always think that, after you retire, will you will need less money. Technically, it may or it may not be true. It depends on how you live your lifestyle, your lifestyle choices. Your li healthy life expectancy, maybe 10% is dependent on genes, good genes. 90% is from life lifestyle choices. Do you exercise? Do you eat good food and all that? So with that thing when you with aging aging is not only associated with cognitive decline physical abilities decline is also associated with poverty because your health care costs suddenly will take over the other cost components that you were spending on like so technically it will be after you retire or you stop being productive it's like a u curve first you will still spend a lot Right, because you want to go jet setting and you're still healthy. After that, you become a bit more, you know, less uh, active, so you don't need that much. But after that, you get the disease. So then your healthcare costs will start to burden. So it's very crucial to prepare for this eventuality. So that's issue number two. And number three is the gender pay gap. For every 100 ringgit a woman, I mean, a man earns, a woman gets 66 ringgit. So we are underpaid. I'm not saying that it happens to all of us, right. but many of us. Okay, Paslina, what? Why is it important for women to save money? Thank you for that, Balkis. Yeah. Um, according to what Balkis has said, uh, we tend to live longer, but are we living better? Yeah. So because of that motion that I always carry that with me, uh, I think we need to make sure that. We understand, we acknowledge that, yes, we are, alhamdulillah, because with the technology these days, we are living longer, thanks to the medication, thanks to the medical technology. But the, the bigger question here is, are we living better, whether from financially, medically, and also your surroundings, right? So, um, I was just sharing with Erin, nobody wants to talk about my topic. Yeah, because you know, we all know, it's it's death is certain. It's not what if, it's when, right? So, in preparation to that, right, we need to make sure that we plan, right? That is very important because if you have that plan in place, whatever statistics that we have, we can narrow the gap. Yeah, so that will actually help us to move further and also to make sure that we have something in hand to hold so that we can control ourselves. Yeah, that's a sobering thought because it's not if, but it's when. Tax and death is uh, permanent. Yeah. It will happen. It's a fact. Erin, why do you think you're, you're someone who's, you know, of course, young, but also you've already made that preparations and you're already in this line. Uh, why do you think it's important to save for retirement? Okay, I agree with Kabakis and Kapas um, Mushin. How long, I want to ask all of you, how long does it take for us to build a habit? How long? 14 days. <laughs> 14 days. 14 days to have a solid habit. So imagine habits of saving money or investing. Imagine you starting only late 30s. Is it as easy to maintain in comparison to starting it at the, starting it at the age of 20? Of course it's easier when you start early. It's just the same as exercising. How many of us know people who have exercised when they were younger and they still continue exercise in comparison to people who are in their 30s who just started exercising? So habits built the most in, in behind the reasoning why we have to start investing. In my case, I was forced to invest and save by my mother. She's here, by the way. Um, at the age of 18. At the age of 18. So um, doing this habitually is more important in comparison to having an objective, for example, retirement. I want to retire with this much money, um, this much investment, this much profits, this much dividends to 
continue living my life. So in, in comparison to having an objective, when we have habits, sometimes we invest and save because it's habitual. You don't need a reason to save or invest, which is even better than having a goal to invest. So in my opinion, just to summarize um, the, the question, all the answers that were given by Kak Balkis and Kak Fas, correct. But most importantly, doing it early enhances your ability to sustain your investment and savings habit. So the starting point is by having that habit, by having that intention. Uh, then that begs the question, where do I start? How much do I save? Uh, where do I invest? Before we even get there, what would you say are some of the obstacles to women putting down money aside, whether for investment or for, for, for savings? We have to pay off debts, we have family responsibilities, the endless groceries, we've got lifestyle wants, uh, we sometimes take a break from our, our work uh, because we're starting a family and so on and so forth. What do you think, or from your perspective, what has been some of the challenges for women? Traditionally, but I think, I think now has changed, uh, we depend on men. The independence wasn't there simply because I think the, the nature, how it's been formed, right? But um, without realizing it, um, you know, when, when you rely on someone, when you rely on something, uh, you are you are stuck in a cage and you can't fly, right? Uh, and there's there's nothing wrong in getting yourself educated, in getting yourself finding more knowledge. And we are so so blessed having Mr. Google these days, right, to help us to just find out what you want to know, right? Uh, it is all about empowering yourself with right information again. Google can mislead you to something else, right? Uh, and I think with education, with knowledge, you would, you know, you don't need to be a, a CEO, you don't need to be a career woman, you just need to be you. You just need to make sure, look at your surrounding, and what are the important things that you should know to make sure that you are able to handle the challenges because life can throw you here and there. You know, you're, you're not going to be a static situation, especially when you're a wife, you're a mother. And with the aging population, we have to take care of our parents, right? So with all those roles comes with challenges, right? right? How, how do we navigate that if you don't have knowledge? So I think that's the key message that I would like to share today with everyone because I think education is key for everything. True. Right. We looked at the stats as well and see that majority of women are not uh, investing or putting their savings aside in EPF as well. What has EPF seen as some of the obstacles or challenges for, me, for women setting aside savings for the future? Number one issue, I think, is like lack of uh, income. So why lack of income? Women's participation in labor force is only 56%. And that's lower than many countries in ASEAN. If you look at trends, if you're a more advanced economy, women's participation is higher. With participation in labor force, you get income. So when you have income, you can save. But when you look at middle income countries like Malaysia, the labor force participation for women is low, lower than less developed countries. And that is a trend that you see everywhere because when you are in less developed country, you have women working in the informal sector. They become you know, entrepreneurs, they sell things or by the roadside and all the income, families need to elevate their income level. So the participation is higher. So in middle income countries, we find this trend. So we need to get more women into the labor force because with, without income, it's hard to save unless you get your husband or a significant other to give you nafka or give you something for you to be able to see if that's number one. Number two is the intermittent career breaks. And in other countries, you see this trend. So for women, when they become in their productive years, they, they first join after I graduate 
from high school or even go to university, I will go into the labor force. And then I get married. And then you drop out because you need to care for your children. So in other countries, after a period of being productive, productive or reproductive, reproductive years, women come back to work because there are incentives, there are policies in place looking at women's well-being. But in Malaysia, after you become, when I look at EPF data as well as the labor force data, after you reach 27 to 30, you start dropping out of the labor force and they don't come back. They call this a single hump. But in Malaysia, yeah, in Malaysia, but in other countries, you have the double hump. So then, then they come back to work, and then women do not lose anything if you are living in Scandinavia because that time taken to take care of your children is now being taken care of in terms of your promotion, in terms of your career advancements. But it doesn't happen here. And in many countries, I just want to share this with you. In Germany, childcare is free. Free. When women go back to work, the amount that they collect from women from the tax, more than enough to pay for free childcare. The United Kingdom did that in 2022, also free childcare. But in many Scandinavian countries, it's publicly managed childcare that is heavily subsidized. For instance, if I have to pay for childcare about 2,000 euros, I only pay 190 uh, euro euros right. for that. So it's 90% subsidized by the government. So we need policies to encourage women. And it's not just looking at one part. For women to come back to work, there must be daycare centers. For children, daycare centers for, for the elderly. So on average, a woman spends four hours you know, doing caring work, domestic yeah. work, compared to men, which is about 1.7 hours. So we are significantly disadvantaged. There must be policies that will support women in order to do all this and we work together. And, and that is so important because that really pushes up what we're discussing today to a high level where a lot more years and eyes really need to look into this topic. And, you know, we probably need ministers and prime ministers and more people uh, at this, this, this discussion on a national level. Just wanted to bring up some uh, uh, stats here. A 2020 survey by AKPK found that 53% of Malaysian women reported as what you highlighted earlier. They feel stress about their financial situation and they have significant concern about retirement planning because they are nurturers and caregivers. Erin, I'm coming to you right now, taking a leave of what has been said in terms of obstacles for women to really look at their savings. How can also then we plan for unexpected uh, life events? As you mentioned, it could take you here and there, uh, even perhaps divorce, the death of a spouse, sudden illness. Uh, what do we do to ensure then that we have a secure retirement? Um, I grew up in a household where my dad, both my dad and my mom are in business. So my, dad's, my dad has a construction company. Um, we've seen him fly. We've seen him at his peak. Obviously, income is also at his peak. We've also seen him go through some shortcomings. And that's when my mom's income fly. So I feel like when it comes to our household, there's absolutely no such thing as one person holding a stronger income, especially when they are in business. Back then, we see um, people in business having to go through phases. But now we see it happening amongst politicians. One day your party is ruling, another day your party is not. And you're like, okay, what do I do now? And then you see that happening amongst engineers. I've had clients in oil and gas that one time when I meet them, they're super cash rich. Another day they're not employed anymore and they're depending on their wife's income and their wives are just selling nasi lemak, but, but when there are issues or crises that happens, one person in the household will always be the stronger person to support another. So that's what I see growing up in my household with my mom and my dad. Issues like this happen. I've also, I also have some team members who has a group in AKPK and most of them are bankrupt. Most of them are young and the issues always go back to healthcare, just like Kapalakis mentioned. Ma tak sihat, mother is unwell, no medical cut, no access to fundings, do not, cannot go to or depend on government hospitals. They have to fork out money for this one person. So I think when it comes to women, 
this is the mindset that we should have. It's always nice to have more money. If you don't want to work or you don't want to earn money or you don't want to do anything because I don't have to, my husband's around, must think at the same time, it's always nice to have more money. If, if it's not to support your husband, it's for you. And especially in this day and age where there are so many nice things. Nice tudongs, nice baju, nice makeup. Everything is nice. <laughs> Agree with me, ladies? Yes. Agree? Nice Agree? places to travel and nice exactly. food to eat and all that. Yeah, yeah correct. So I, I, I have a lot of friends who are constantly wanting new things because they see their friends having it, posting it on Instagram. So we are in this day and age where pressure doesn't come from what we want. Pressure comes from what we see amongst all of us. So if this becomes... A reason why you have or go and work and earn more money so be it okay so it's nice to have more money but you mentioned earlier that if you have income you can save here's the question how what if my income is not enough to save and how then do we plan for retirement from that perspective to have the trust uh, fund and and how does it work let's break it down how Fazlina. okay i yes i agree as because women tend to have lesser income based on the statistic, statistic but uh, there was this story that I, I just read recently on, uh, on uh, Instagram where the mother is, um, she's a housewife, she takes care of five children and every month um, the, the husband, the, the father gives an X amount of money to run the household and and the children just found out that every time when the father gives that money to her she puts some x amount of money aside for herself right uh and the thing is when it comes to um you know this is the power of compounding right so fast forward 15 years later um when the children wanted to um of course the children went for high school studied and graduated. On the graduation day, um, of course, the mother was uh, saying that uh, they have five children. Um, she said that, um, uh, one of the children said that, Mom, I wish that we have enough funds to go. And the father is a public servant. So, and the mother was very, of course, the mother didn't tell anybody that the, the money that she has saved on um, she must have her own reason. But with that money, because she knows that um, there's an important occasion that to be celebrated. So she actually took out the money and the father and the children were so surprised that she was able to fund the whole entire family trip to the UK. Yeah? So, yes, income can be, you know, it can be small, it can be big, but if you're able, as what Erin says, start early, and if you're able to do that, and it, it, again, it comes back to the habit, right? If you're able to do that, the small income will eventually grow. Go back to sedikit, sedikit, lama, lama. Yeah, betul. Yeah. Right. So with that habit, the intention to save and making a conscious effort to put it uh, aside as well. But then that also is another conversation. Say money is quote unquote dead in the bank. You could invest it and uh, you know, Aaron, you might have something to say about that. But let's look at retirement for, for now. How much is enough? How much do you need after 60? Assuming the median uh, age for uh, retirement is a around there. Uh, you know, you want to pursue the dreams, you want to travel, you want to, you, as you mentioned the curve earlier, you want to spend that money up front, uh, especially when, as soon as you, you, you retire, you want to seek for an adventure. How much is enough? I think to answer that question, how much is enough is up to you. It's your choice. Technically, it's your life. Do you want to live a life as a monk and live with very minimalism concept with, you know, and live by the forest and then uh, you know eat things from the river and do that so that, that's one example but on the other extreme do i want to be a warren buffet you know or you know live a lifestyle that is like crazy rich asian 
or even you just want to have a moderate lifestyle. So first, you have to determine your aspiration, right? So do you want to go jet setting or are you happy just uh, pergi mengaji dekat pondo when you're old to focus on your next life, right? So <laughs> these are lifestyle choices. But up to a certain level, you need money, right? You need money to buy things, yeah? But although I have to caution that in this age of materialism, age of consumerism, is people, you know, spending money they don't have through getting credit, purchasing things that they don't need to impress people who don't even care about them. So we need to have a mindset shift. You know, so when you think about retirement, you have to think like this. Where is the income going to come from when you are retired? When you no longer work, when you are semi-working, because you're not going to work forever. Up to a point, a person can no longer be productive. Although in some cultures, they can be productive. If I'm a surgeon, after a while, tangan I ketak-ketak juga kan. Uh, so, so that means you need to understand your limits. So how much is enough first determine some basic level. So if you have a house, you have children to care for you because we're a sandwich generation and you know that you have children, then in a way, familial structure can come in to support the rest. So at the very basic le level, from the EPF perspective, we say that, okay, at the minimum level, if you don't have anything else, you need 240,000 in today's terms. So that is like a thousand ringgit just to buy food. We expect that you have already shelter over your head, staying with somebody or you have your own house. But if you want a better lifestyle, which is comfortable, we define that as adequate savings. And that adequate savings, we benchmark that against a single elderly person needing about 2,500 per month and times 12 times 20 and you get 600,000. So that's basic and the second level is adequate. The third level we call enhance. Enhance, we times two the adequate level. But then you determine your number because that's what we are saying based on average, right? What a typical person needs, right? But coming back to you, the number uh, to answer your question, there are a few methods to determine what's a good number. So right now, let's say you are comfortable, Erin, to live with 10,000 ringgit per month, right? Because she wants her makeup, you know, <laughs> whatever. So then you times 10, uh, times 12 for 12 months, times 20, yeah? But that's for my generation. But for future generation, one in three children of Gen Y will live to be 100 years old. And the longest living person in modern age, she lived to be 122 years old. Her name is Jean Comon. So, okay, that's number one. So you take your number right now, you Kali 12, Kali 20, that's your number. But the other method is to look at 70% of that income, assuming at age 60, you would have paid up your mortgage, you'd have covered your car loans and all the big ticket items are being paid off. So Which that's unfortunately the magic. is not always the case in reality for most people. Perhaps. Yeah, yeah. It's not it's not the reality, but then that's why how you determine a number. But then you need to then make a plan on how to get there if okay. you are. Balkis, thank you for that. Erin, I'm coming to you. Um, as a younger person who's really involved in, you know, a lot of uh, investments and you have some knowledge in this area, how much is enough? Back to Kat Marcus' answer, it, it really depends on lifestyle. Uh, I've got friends who, who are okay with living with 5,000 bucks per month. I've got friends who need 10,000. In my case, with my mortgage, the car, and the investments, it, it differs. It differs. It depends on lifestyle, most importantly. Especially when we're living in KL, where inflation is high. Look at how much we're paying for parking, guys. Parking di pavilion berapa? Tak campur makan lagi, right? Tak campur all the boba tea, whatever, stuff like that. That's like one cup is how much? So it, it goes back to lifestyle. And with regards to lifestyle, it tends to be a habit where we are we are, are we able to part with these things when we are at, at an age where I'm so used to all these, how do I part with certain things just to make ends meet? So I don't have a definitive answer to how much is enough, but just, just from um, statistics that we've done, because I recruit people and we have a chart, people staying in KL, if you want to be comfortable M40, um, emerging M40 to upper M40, 
5,000 is the baseline. 1,000 monthly. 5,000 monthly is the baseline income. And you must have 20% allocation for, for investment. 5,000 is not 5,000. You really spend all. It has to... It, you have to eventually take out 20% for your investment, for your savings. Yeah. Christina, I see you there with your finger. You're thinking very deep. I know you have something to say. <laughs> Tell us. Yeah. So they are the numbers person. Yeah. So they, they make the money. I got the money. All right. <laughs> I, I like that. <laughs> yeah. So they, they are the angels for, for, for investments and everything. Now, uh, as what Erin has just said just now, we have to start with habit, right? And in terms of the amount, again, it all depends on your needs, your, your, your desire, you know? And one thing, if let's say, um, if anything were to happen to you, and if you have loans with you, be sure that the, the banks won't forgive the loan, okay? <laughs> They'll come and haunt you at your grave, okay? So, I think it's very important. I'm, I'm bringing back to the drawing board why planning is very important, Jesse. Because you can have big number, small number, but if you don't plan as to how much income you have, as how much liabilities you have, then during your retirement years, you're going to have an issue of how do you manage your liabilities when there's no more income in place. That's number one. Number two, tiba-tiba you mati. You meninggal, right? Who's going to take care of the debts? Because the financial institution is not going to forgive the loan. It's your family member that's going to take over that loan, right? And is that something that you want to leave behind for your families? So I think going back to the question, how much is enough? It all depends on your needs your family dynamics, and also in terms of what you want to leave behind for your family members. I mean, you don't need to leave anything if you don't want to. It's really entirely your choice, right? But uh, for Muslims, we believe in afterlife. And we believe that uh, when we pass on, everything stops except for our charity, right? Our prayers to righteous uh, children to the to the parents and your ongoing education for the community so if that is already your, your intention when you've passed on then it's good i mean if you're ready to live with that then that's fine but if you have families on the side you have children you need to plan you need to start planning Today, today, I see that a lot of people are going have to come that and habit. See you Fourteen days, get it start. Yeah, that's right. Fourteen days to create and can stick I, to that habit. So Please can I add just on say thoughts. something? Just a short advertising. By the way, money in EPF is protected against any creditors' claim. The banks cannot come after you. Just to say that. <laughs> you, you can put up to a hundred thousand now, right? Hundred thousand ringgit yeah, a year. Yeah. Outside money can, yeah. uh, on voluntary basis, can go up to a hundred thousand. So. It's very important that you diversify your portfolio. I'm not saying that put everything there, not put your eggs in one basket. But it's also important to know, I think most people don't know that. And in a way, a lot of the money there is also tax-free because, you know, you don't pay tax. In other countries, there are penalties for early withdrawals, so on and so forth. Right. Uh, very quickly, roundtable, um, I'd like to get your opinion on how women can grow their savings or investments for the future. Uh, that's a question even I would like to know. I'd like to pick all your brains. We don't have much time left on the clock uh, today. I know it's been so interesting, but that's why the networking session is there. Balkis, perhaps I'll start with you. Okay, I think uh, number one, you first have to pay yourself. You always forget your future self because it's not going to happen today. You put priorities on current needs, right? So pay your future self first and then you spend for your commitments and your financial needs on other things. So rule number one is to know 50, 30, 20. So 50% for your expenses, uh, you know, 30% for your commitments to get loans and mortgage and 20% for savings and investments. That's like a great thing if you can do that. But for those people that can't do that, you can also work on 40, 40, 20, yeah, or 50, 40, 10. So you can vary that based on your needs. So to say that people cannot save, I think it can be done. It requires discipline, right? So Warren Buffet 
start saving when he's 10 years old. By age 30, he already is a multimillionaire. By 96, he has $90 billion in his account. But if Warren Buffet is a normal human being, with that habit, he will still accumulate $12 million by the age of 60. So it can be done. It's not impossible. Can be done, ladies and gentlemen. You can start today. It's never too late, right? Yeah, and, and if I can say some EPF statistics, if you're earning minimum wage, 1,500 ringgit, if you don't do any withdrawal and you leave the money there, you will have close to 900,000 just with 5 to 6% increase uh, in terms of dividends. So we pay more than double the principal that you put in because of the way that we're designed. Like uh, mentioned by Erin, the power of compounding works like miracle yeah. over 50, 70 years. Thank you so much, Balkis. Erin, how can women grow their savings and investments in future um, in 30 seconds, if you can? Um, look at yourself um, having to maintain the lifestyle that you have right now. Allocate that money for that. Like, for example, Erin, you want to maintain this kind of lifestyle? Allocate a portion of your income today for Erin in the future because you don't want Erin in the future who's older to be suffering and to be working hard like how, sh how you were when you were younger. So that's the mentality that I tell myself. It's always how we tell ourselves and how to do it is simple. You got to make sure you consciously allocate it outside your bank account, invest it somewhere else that gives bigger return than our current inflation. Thank you so much. Yeah, so we've heard all is gold, right? We've, we've heard this term, all is gold. And you don't want to retire feeling sad, having nothing in your pocket. So you have to make sure that you create the habit, making sure that you have that plan, what you want to leave behind for your families. And as what Balki said, you know, you have uh, an institution that supports a safe uh, place to invest and making sure that you know your money grows for your retirement and and what currently EPF is doing is something commendable and and we are we are blessed to have them you know to come forward and to to address this issue because we are an aging population people are living longer right and I said just now are we living better in terms of financially if you don't plan from now then how do you make sure that when you retire, you want to retire with good lifestyle? You right. want to retire not being depressed of not having money, right? So how do we want to upkeep them? You got to plan. If you don't plan, then you will suffer the consequences. Perhaps at this juncture, uh, you could walk us through and say a few words when it comes to um, the role and services for women by Maybank trustees. Okay, so as I mentioned just now, um, you know, death is certain, it's when, and it is also that we, we, we must understand why uh, we have to plan ahead because we cannot time death, right? So that is why uh, I'm a big advocate to, uh, you know, make people understand why having a tool such as will or wasiat is important uh, to make sure that whatever that you leave behind uh, is being managed and administered properly. That's number one. Number two, I think also particularly um, for the Muslims, uh, we always always have this, this thought that um, bila dah ada faraid, kenapa perlu ada wasiat? Yeah? So during your lifetime, who takes care of your assets? Who takes care of your liabilities? It's yourself, right? So when you pass on, who is going to take care of that first before Farai comes? So Farai is a distribution. When you have a wasya instrument in place, you have two phases. You need somebody to step in into your role to administer before the distribution comes into play. All right. So this is what we do in, in, in Maybank Trusts. We are subsidiary of the Maybank Group. We've been here for over 60 over years um, and why we want to advocate people in writing a will because that is the basic estate planning tool that everybody must have right more so if your mother if you have children below 18 
in the event if anything were to happen to both of you, the parents, both the mother and the father, who's going to be the guardian for your children? Yeah, by having that will or WhatsApp instrument in place, you have the advantages of appointing someone who knows your family dynamic, who can take care of your children, who can take over your role when you're not around. So, coming to all, you know, when we talk about money, retirement, now, if anything were to happen to you, who's going to take care of this money? Yeah, so that's why planning is very important and at Maybank Trustees, we help clients to look into what are the assets that you have. If anything were to happen to you today, what is your game plan? So this is the conversation that we do for our clients. And of course, if let's say you have specific wishes, if you have, let's say, if you want to take care of your aging parents, or if you have special new child, do you want to set up a trust fund for them when you're not around? Because don't forget, the moment you pass on, all your assets are frozen. So until then, until you get the surat kuasa, you can't touch that money. So in the course of waiting for the surat kuasa to come out, how do you make sure that your family is being taken care of? More so when you have small children, right? So this is something that we, we, we do on a daily basis. This is my bread and butter. Like I said, I'm the financial guardian, right? So, so, so they are the one who makes the money for you all and I'm here to protect your money. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you for sharing as well. Move on to EPF Balkis. Perhaps you could also explain a little bit of EPF's role in terms of uh, services for women. I think uh, one of the critical changes that Malaysians need to see about the EPF going forward is EPF is not a savings institution. We are a retirement income security institution. So we need this paradigm shift whereby we shouldn't see our lump sum as the sole thing that we're waiting for when you reach 55 or 60. So how do you make your money last longer? You need to you think like, I need monthly income. So treat it like that. So I think that's the biggest shift that I need uh, to work with all of us Malaysians in terms of having this paradigm shift, which is not happening right now because we are so used to having lump sum. It worked when life expectancy was 54 years old in 1950 when EPF was set up. But today, fast forward like 70 years um, going forward, EPF's uh, role needs to evolve. And life expectancy today for women is 78. It's going to be longer and longer. By 2050, life expectancy in Malaysia will uh, reach 80 years old. So you, you need to plan for that eventuality because you need that income, that lifeline, uh, so to speak. It doesn't matter even if you don't take uh, you know, uh, all of it. You can leave some so that you continue to get income. Because you see, when you leave your money... Your principal, yeah, for in 40 years with us, maybe that principal will grow five, ten times. But over 70 years, that money can grow to become 30 times more than you have. Because even if you're 60, the compounding still work. If you run a calculator on compounding, you will see that at first kind of near, then it goes and then it's just it just went insane right so we need to understand that and uh, you know appreciate what we have yeah so uh, we are hoping that Malaysians can start planning and and oh, of course I want to say this also I think in the US you know that there's a, a movement they call it fire movement right so financial independence retire early right so they try to grow their portfolio to up a, to a certain level and then they will spend just the dividends from that portfolio. So looking at that, I, I just want to give uh, two more tips before I, I hand over to the Madam MC here. So like, how do you then plan for your decumulation? Decumulation comes from the word accumulation, but you deaccumulate. So first you accumulate when you're productive, then you start to deaccumulate, right? So then the way that you don't want to erode your financial well-being is do not accumulate, decumulate more than 4% of your portfolio. But if you look at your portfolio, let's say you have a million ringgit, 
if you uh, there's no growth in that portfolio the 4% rule means your money will last 25 years if you take 3% of your savings that 3% means you can live for 33 years that's how the money, the time it will last unless you just live on the bit dividends and you juggle the capital or if you use 2% of your portfolio then you will stretch the money to 50 years so we need to start thinking like that right and then going back to investing how safe is investing uh, in terms of putting in higher risk instruments so we we would recommend that you use the rule 100 rule 100 means that you take 100 you minus your age so that gentleman looks like he's 20 years old oh. so that means you can put the maximum <laughs> 80% into equities, right? So you can use that as a rule, but that doesn't mean that you max it out. So we need to understand uh, those rules, uh, you know, in terms of investing, those rules for withdrawing and, and utilizing your EPF wisely, right? Uh, because you need to make sure that it does not outlive you. Because you need to care for long-term care because in this country, healthcare is geared to short-term care, and hospitalization. We don't talk about long-term care, a person being bedridden and needs care on a day-to-day -day basis. Who's gonna finance that? Do you have that? So we also understand from survey that the they prefer, they prefer to age in place. They don't wanna go to live in retirement homes. But if you can afford it, you can afford care at home. But if you cannot, you need to start planning for that eventuality, I think, thank you. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. That rounds out our panel discussion for today. Um, it has been truly insightful and I think many key takeaways here. There's so much to you know, uh, reflect on as well and to really understand that although we, we get the concepts of investment and saving for retirement and you know, for having trust, um, it is the finer points that we really need to learn. I think I've also picked up quite a bit here today. First and foremost, we begin with habits, uh, getting that in place, ensuring there's a plan for our post death uh, for our loved ones as well, and understanding how EPF also works and what we can do uh, when we contribute and how that curve can also uh, facilitate our retirement plans. I had more questions about, you know, do we buy the branded bag and do we invest in this and that, but I think we'll leave that for the networking session. You can direct all your questions uh, to our, um, uh, our experts up here later on during the financial se uh, session, the uh, networking session. Right, so we move on now to our confession box, uh, the little mystery boxes in which all of you have uh, left anonymously your confessions. I'd like to actually open up the floor to get two volunteers up here. Uh, we'll start with one volunteer first who will pick out uh, questions from uh, this box and uh, I think it's going to be really exciting to find out some people's confessions here. Um, so can I get a volunteer up on stage? We have one on standby. Fantastic. Okay, lucky pick. Um, pick out from the confession box. Hello everyone, my name is Hannah. Uh, thank you for you lovely ladies for like opening up the panel and talking about the finances. So. I have two confessions here. They're not mine, just to be clear. <laughs> okay, so I'll read the first one. <clears throat> it seems that we are addicted to loans and our salary are only the way to pay. How do we overcome this? That's the first question. So the second one is, this one's a bit of a long one. My parents have a business and are forcing me to join that business. Yes, it has supported our very comfy lifestyle, but I want to have my own career. But my friend says that I'm not that great and should just benefit from my family's business. What should I do? <laughs> Is that really your friend? Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, ladies, I hope you've heard that question. Let's start with the first one. Um, it's become almost a habit uh, to, to get into loans. Uh, how do you perceive this and what can be done to undo that? Opening up to anyone who's ready to answer. Can I answer this? Sure. Sorry. Um, loans. There are many types of loans out there. Business loans, personal loans, mortgage, uh, car, right? 
what do you think? What are the two loans that you feel is slightly safer than the other two? Can I hear? House, very good. Mortgage, another one? Car, right? What about personal loans? What do you think about personal loans? So, exactly. Okay, so here's the thing. Loans are loans and obviously, kita macam pinjam duit lah. Imagine if the bank is not a bank and it's an alum, you pinjam jump duit is a loan, correct? So loans in this day and age is so highly hyped up, publicized because also because of lifestyle that's pe that people has been uh, showing. And I have, um, out of all my um, clients, I have a number, the younger, the younger below 30 clients, I do ask them on what loans they have. Because before we do submission, we have to do their financial health check to check how much loans they have. Most of them have personal loans. Most of them also took up personal loans before getting married. So here's the thing about loans. It's available everywhere. You go to any banks, if you were to say you want personal loan, it's easy for them to offer. And the loan offices in this day and age are also very, very aggressive. So having or selling loans are... It's, it's a normal thing. It's a day-to-day -day thing in this day and age. But you choose what loan you want to take up. If it helps to get you the car and you can pay your monthly loans, go ahead. If you choose to take out a mortgage for your house, you can pay your monthly loan, go ahead. But always remember that interest comes into the picture as well. So in my case, I also have some clients who have retired and the first thing they do with their money once they get their money from EPF, thanks EPF. <laughs> Once they get their money from EPF, is settlekan hutang dahulu. If you look at loans like hutang, you'll be scared to take up loans. I think it goes back to mentality. Um, it's not wrong. It's not right. Uh, it depends on how you utilize the loan, how you treat the loan, and how much you put into paying off the loan. So that's my opinion on loans. Whoever that asked the question, I hope you can educate and really, really feel it in yourself to takut sikit to take up too much loans. Okay. Second question, uh, or if uh, Balkis and Pasna, you have something to chime in for the first yeah. question on loans. Just, just to add on that, like I said, I'm the financial guardian, right? Dah ambil utang, make sure bayar. That's a two. Number two, Esok bila meninggal, siapa nak bayar hutang tu? So plan, ambil insurance. At least, bila dah meninggal, duit insurance tu boleh cover your liability. Nombor tiga, you beli insurance, you bayar premium kan? I jual insurance pula sekarang. <laughs> you, you beli insurance, you bayar premium. So I'm going to share you one story. One of my clients during COVID, um, the early stage of COVID where you don't even want to touch that person. So he was medically induced into coma and uh, his wife came to us and said that, um, you know, I've got bills to pay I've, because he has business, right? And uh, he has, she has to pay the staff salary. So, macam nak ambil duit? Mama tu, I see you good, right? How do you, I mean, the banker can't call the person. Uh, because you know there's no way that he can make any call back or what so what he did was um, he actually set up a trust with us right and under the trust so what is the trust actually trust is imagine rumah or imagine a syndrome bahad having assets inside the syndrome bahad and it holds it if anything happens to you, that trust can jalan without being frozen. So I'm just giving you an analogy what trust is. So this person, he set up a trust and under the trust, he had an investment portfolio. He had his family home. He had uh, insurance policy. Now, during that time, because we are in need of money, so because the trust that he set up, he gives us the power that in the event, if anything happens to him now, so technically he's incapacitated, right? So we are able to activate the trust and to take the money in the trust to, to fulfill the obligations that he had. But at that time, market was very down. Everything was in red. Whatever investments that he had, everything was in red. 
As a prudent trustee, it doesn't make sense for me to liquidate that investment. So what we did was, we looked at what are the assets that he had under the trust. So it was the insurance policy. Right. So you pay premium, there's a cash value inside there. Yes. It behaves like a Peggy bank. Yes. So we managed to withdraw sufficient funds from there. And we are, were able to pay the bills as well as salary of the staff. So the message that I'm trying to say here, you don't need to even start say, having a trust or what, nothing. Number one, plan. Dah ada hutang, make sure there's a backup, how you're going to settle the loan, even when you're still alive. That's number one. Number two, again, I'm selling insurance here. <laughs> Why I say insurance is very important, it is because when you, when you, you know, when like the question just now, I have salary, I need to take loan, I cannot stop you from taking loan, right? Because we need to take, we need some financial assistance, that's why we take loan, right? So, but you must have some plan and backup in place that if anything were to happen to you, there is insurance policy here and it is important to start from young. Okay, I've got to jump to the next question. Thank you, uh, Faslina. Uh, the second question was, uh, my family is forcing me into a business. Um, what do I do about that, uh, Valkis? Okay, I think um, it's important to balance priorities um, with ourselves. Because first you have to manage yourself. You need to manage upwards, which in this case, your parents. And then you need to manage your peers and then, of course, people that you know as well. So I guess it's balancing the priorities. But before you do that, my advice to the confessor is to do this. So find your ikigai. I don't know if you've heard of the term ikigai. Japanese. Ikigai means like the reason you wake up in the morning that is practiced by the Japanese people. So the first thing that you ask is that, does the world need this job that you, know, you want to do? Like for me, I'm a social security expert. Yes, the world needs social security people in public sector because we don't make profit from that, all right? So the world needs that. Number two, the question to ask is that, do you love doing that thing? So if I'm Siti Nohaliza, the world needs entertainer and I'm, I love singing, so that's great, right? But that doesn't fulfill everything because do I get paid for it? So no point if I'm Balkis, I cannot sing to save my life. The world needs an entertainer. I love singing, but I suck as a singer. So I'm not going to make money from it. Nobody's going to invite me to sing. So you need to align these priorities. And lastly, are you good at it, right? So you need to ask those questions. So I don't know who's the friend that said that. So you find your ikigai. If your ikigai is aligned with what your parents are expecting, then that's awesome. Because then you're going to like what you're doing because you, the world needs it. You love doing it, you get paid for it, and you're good at it. If not, if there's any one of these components are missing, so let's say I'm not good at it, I love doing it, the, work, the world needs it, and I get paid, but I get insecurity. I'm underperforming in my work, right? So even if I love, I'm passionate about something, I don't get paid for it, then there's no point. I need to live and pay my bills. So you need to make sure that the ikigai is aligned uh, to your priorities as well. So I think that's the first thing that you need to do to answer uh, the question. But maybe, I don't know how the, the question is worded, maybe your friend had the best of intentions to make you realize certain things. Sometimes we cannot just tell people things they want to hear. A good friend will also tell you things in a nice way, of course, not being disrespectful or anything, yeah. tells you things that you need to hear. Things that you want to hear and things that you need to hear can be two different things. There are gaps. So like in the reality. You sometimes yeah, just yeah. have to you need, face what yes, is reality. Yes. Thank you so much, Balkis, for that. Uh, the confessions are coming through, but we can't take all. We've got another two on a standby, so I'm looking for another volunteer. Please uh, read out the confessions, uh, or rather pick out that confession uh, from the box. We have a volunteer on standby. Fantastic. Good questions coming from the floor. Thank you so much for these confessions, um, I think we can all, you know, understand where these comes from because we are all familiar with some of these uh, financial uh, problems. Hi everyone, my name is Kedar, and I'll be asking two questions that are not mine. <laughs> everyone so wants first, to put out the disclaimer. The first question is, I don't buy many things, but when I do, 
I make big purchases because I felt like it and would compensate for all the money that I didn't use for the month. I am having trouble. I lack awareness of having enough money for the future. Second question. So the first question was, I like buying things. I don't Big buy purchases. a lot, but when I buy, stop. I buy, ev <laughs> I buy everything. I Correct. spend a lot. Lack buy. awareness of having enough money for the future. So that's why you are here today. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for that question. Okay. Second one. How do I convince my husband to invest and include me in Hiba? We don't have a son. Sad wife. That's a tricky Send your one. husband to Maybank Trust. I'm going to take question number two. <laughs> okay. Let's start with question number two first. Erin, uh, you want to go ahead? Um, real life story. I just want to share with you guys. I have a friend, a, a, a couple. Well, the friend is a, a, a lady. And then there's the husband. Husband does not believe in takaful, does not believe in insurance. Because he grew up in an environment where parents are comfortable but and things that whatever that they have is enough. Kalau parents meninggal, pada pandailah anak-anak deal with things. Padahal agama kita Islam ni. Okay? Pat patutnya kita kena menjaga anak cucu kita moving forward. Betul? So, um, I'll get back to English <laughs> because I saw some faces already. Okay, here's the thing. I have a friend who purchased Hiba life insurance. Life insurance, um, Hiba is, is under takaful, which is Shariah. A lady friend who purchased Hiba under her own name paid by herself because if anything were to happen to the husband the wife will get it wife wife paid for the hiba under his name sorry under his name nominated the wife because if anything were to happen to the husband wife gets the money wife needs to sort out expenses your netflix is going to continue your net netflix payment your cell com bills your your housing loan your car Loans are going to continue. So who's going to pay for it when the husband passed on, correct? The hiba will pay. So this is something that we need to continuously educate, just like what Kafaz mentioned just now. People think buying insurance is just buying insurance, but you don't understand the purpose behind purchasing it. It's to menyenangkan. It's to continue the longevity, the livelihood of your family members, of the hutang-hutangs that you left. The loans that you left, the debts that you left for your family members to take after. So if your husband, I'm sorry for that lady who asked this question, but if your husband doesn't agree with this, make him sign the hiba that's paid by you. Because if you believe in it and you purchase it under your name, if anything were to happen to you, your husband will get it. But what happens if something happens to him and you get nothing? Okay, thank you very much. That's all. Thank you for that. Those who fail to plan, plan to fail. So you need to be prepared. Unfortunately, this is also something. So if uh, I can just reality. add a little bit, I think to that person, it's, it's a hard conversation. I, I think why she asked that question because she's not able to convince the husband to do, right? So maybe one of the ways that we can help you is you come and talk to experts, you know, it doesn't have to be maybe and trusty, it can be, there's so many other trusty companies that who does this, but what I'm trying to say here is, you need to have this hard conversation with your spouse. If you don't have this hard conversation with your spouse, what makes you think when that hard situation happens, you are able to handle it? If you can't even carry this conversation now, think about, how are you going to battle when that situation happens? I think that's more even worse than trying to push your husband to buy a hiba because you must have that conversation first to understand the, the problem statement here. And then from there, you navigate your husband, both of you all together. And if you have children, more so a good reason as to why you must do something and as to why you must have that hard conversation. Right. Having those hard conversations. We're going to recap, but just before that, uh, we have that question unanswered. I like to go out and spend money. I don't do it all the time, but when I do, I want to get something, you know, that has a big value. 
Hey, great question, by the way. Confession of a shopaholic. No, <laughs> <laughs> My kids gave me that book and I said, okay, yeah, then I make some change. Because it's very important. We are the role model and they need to see you know, what's good. We, if you're not practicing it, you're not doing what you preach, then they will see there's a gap there and they're not going to be uh, doing that same thing as well. So I'm trying to do this behavioral change as well. Okay, just coming back to that person. So I think maybe I'll talk about about that thing from two dimensions. Number one, I think a few things that you need to bucket, uh, you know, uh, your, your thought patterns on, yeah? Is it, is it something that you love? Is it something that you want? Is it something that you need? Is it something that you like? So you need to bucket the things and ask several questions, whether they pass those, some of those tests, right? So if it's something that I need a handphone, but I want an iPhone. <laughs> this is a different thing, right? Or I need that Prada handbag. But actually, I don't need a Prada handbag. I need a handbag to put my things. I want the Prada handbag, but I need maybe chopped crocodile. I don't know, you know, whatever. Right? So, so you need to be able to differentiate the wants and the needs. But it's okay if you don't really like spend a lot, but you save up for a big ticket item that you think you love. Love is like spending for your mother, for your parents, because they have given birth to you. You want to celebrate their birthday. Takkanlah you not scream on that, right? You will want to spend and treat your parents well. So it's something that you love doing. So you need to be able to bucket these things and then ask if to differentiate once. Just ask your question, is it okay if I don't buy that thing? Am I still alive? You know? So is it going to stop me from, you know, doing certain things that's important or value adding to my life if I don't get it? You need time to wait for a week before you go and get it. Then you clear your mind. Otherwise, when you nampak benda tu kat depan, you're like, oh, I need to get this. So you get confused between wants, needs, like and love. So what you need to consider important will be need and love. Want and like, you can defer. So I hope that dimension will help this person make a better decision, right? Number two is to start planning. I think just to mention again, you need to plan for short term, medium term, and long term. So this person that asked a question is that a short term need, medium term need, or long term need. So you need to start compartmentalizing our thought patterns in that sense to help us make better decisions, right? So then, if it's something that is going to add value to your life, it's important. For example, having an education lengthen your life expectancy between 5 to 19 years. Stopping smoking will help a person who smokes extend life expectancy by 6 years. So make that choice today. If you have a sense of purpose in your life, you will extend your life expectancy barring any act of God by seven years. If you belong to any faith-based groups or religious groups or even association, that will extend your life expectancy between four to 14 years. So it's important. Money is important, but it gets you to some degree. No money in the world can, Steve, uh, can save Steve Jobs from leaving this world. So you need money, but you also need two more things. Your health. Health is wealth. And lastly, meaning, right? Meaning, because it's very important to create that sense of purpose. Once you have all these three things, then you will get the life that you need to lead. So I think that's my advice. Make sure all the priorities are balanced uh, in that manner so that we live a dignified life, right? So um, please, uh, I, I hope I shared some enough knowledge. Thank you so much indeed. Fantastic sharing from our panelists. Uh, so much of experience and know-how in your areas and we will be able uh, to learn more from them during the networking sessions. Make sure you save your questions then. I know many of you have those uh, questions. But for a quick recap, ladies and gentlemen, we look at some of the points that we had discussed today. Uh, of course, it was it has been very uh, you know obvious that planning is important. Having a will in place is important. Thinking about what you do in the event of your early demise um, and also if you have a spouse what do you do what kind of conversations you need to have from an early point saving for your children early on as well insurance 
is important. Uh, but also, I thought what was very interesting is that when you retire, it's not end game. You still need to have some income, a flow of money coming to you, and that your EPF savings is not just the end goal. That you need to have uh, other uh, sort of incomes as well. That goes back to fundamentally, Erin habits uh, which can be uh, you know accumulated or can be uh, uh, sort of absorbed in 14 days if you make a conscious effort also very important ladies and gentlemen understanding the lifestyle that you have evaluating that changing your behavior uh, if that lifestyle is not in line with how much savings you have at this point how much is enough was the question there. Want and like, want and desire, that's important. Gets us into trouble sometimes when uh, we overspend. But also finding your purpose and aligning it with what the Japanese call the ikigai. Uh, that's also uh, important. So that has been the summary. Thank you so much once again, uh, ladies and gentlemen. And thank you, audience, uh, for you know being part and being patient to listen in uh, as well. At this point, I'd like to very much thank our speakers, Head of Policy and Strategy, Balkis Yusuf, Maybank Trustees, Berhad CEO, Noor Fazlina Mohamed Gauss, and Financial and Wealth Planner, Erin Edlina Adnan, for your insightful discussion today. Thank you so much. And on behalf of Sinar Daily, we'd like to give a big thank you to all our sponsors, Maybank and EPF for today. Thank you also to Dua and Tani, Levette, Clinel, Clins, Nourish and Larry. Can we all please give them a big round of applause? <laughs> means a lot to be part of this conversation, uh, to have you here with us today. Hello, this is Osalas. Okay, Hello, this is Osalas. 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 Hello, this is Os